here, Vancouver, British Columbia, the downtown east side. On these notorious streets, Ashley Machiskinik and Daniela Rue lived out their final days. Known as Canada's poorest postal code, Vancouver's downtown east side is plagued by homelessness, drug trafficking, addiction, and sexual exploitation. Ashley Machiskinik was 22 years old when she fell to her death from a fourth story window of the Regent Hotel in Vancouver's downtown east side on September 15, 2010. Years earlier, Daniela Rue went missing from the same neighborhood. They are not the only victims of the downtown east side. At any time during this broadcast or afterwards, if you have any information that might help solve Ashley Machiskinik or Daniela Rue's case, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. Ashley's death came as a shock to those who knew her. Who was with Ashley in the room at the Regent Hotel? Who knows the circumstances surrounding her death? How could Ashley, so young, be lost so tragically and violently? Like so many others, Ashley came from difficult circumstances. She lived in foster homes until she was 12 and then was brought to Vancouver by her mother. It was an escape to find something better, a journey that Ashley's cousin, Mona Woodward, experienced as well. I have a lot of uh, fond memories and um, she was bubbly and, you know, she was always happy. And yeah, she was always given to a lot of the other uh, friends that she had. Like Ashley, Mona sought refuge from abusive foster homes and her home community of Kawakatoos. I left there when I was 14. And I never looked back because I wanted to uh, come to the city, to Vancouver, to have a better life. And I didn't want my kids to be around the, uh, the experiences that I had in Saskatchewan. Came out with a lot of hope. But being alone at 14 in the downtown east side leaves few options for survival. I couldn't find a job when I was 14, so I lived and worked the street. On the street is also where Vancouver police veteran Dave Dixon met a young Ashley Machiskinik. Oh, she was just a sweetheart. She was, you know, I think she was 14 years old when I first met her. You know, she was a sort of another typical kid that was in care of the ministry. You know, and she aged out. You know, that's that term they use, that when they turn 19, they age out of the ministry and they're pretty much left to their own devices. The danger and chaos of the streets wreaked havoc in the life of Ashley Machiskinik. You know, she, she was in and out of hospital all the time. It's a tough one when somebody's really into their addiction. You know, you almost do display symptoms of schizophrenia sometimes. You know, I never seen that myself because when she would get released from hospital, she was as normal as my daughter was and just a sweet, sweet kid. For Ashley, there was no hope of survival. On September 15, 2010, Ashley was found in an alley below a broken fourth story window behind the Regent Hotel. I got a phone call. Uh, something's happened down here. Uh, there was a woman thrown out the window. They just said it was Aboriginal women. They didn't know who. So when I heard it was Ashley, I was just, um, I was really shocked. Uh, the most shocking part of it is that, you know, nobody would say anything. And that code of silence on the downtown east side is so heavy. Well, she went out, you know, I think the fourth floor window of one of the hotels down there into the alley. I remember coming in in the morning, you know, and everybody on the street was telling me about this, this girl that went out the window. You know, and then I found out it was Ashley, and, and I was, you know, I was pretty choked up because I say she was such a nice kid. It was quickly labeled a suicide by the Vancouver police, but those who knew Ashley knew better. The spot where she landed when she came out the window was right across the alley. If you jump out of a window, you know, you don't go 12 feet across the alley. You know, and then there's another couple of, of, of witnesses, you know, you know, that I talked to that, that gave me some information. I didn't think it was a suicide. A few days later, it's in the newspaper. Prostitute, drug addict, commits suicide. Everybody knew that it was a, she was murdered. Uh, you know, you don't throw yourself backwards out a window and are thrown like, you know, 10 feet on the other side of the alley. If, you, if someone jumps, 
It would be right down. You wouldn't be right across the alley. The news of Ashley's death and ruling by the police that it was suicide brought on a firestorm of protest. And as Angela McDougall recalls, they made sure their voices were heard loud and clear. We occupied the police department. There were, eight, there were eight of us that occupied the police department. One of the things that we wanted to make clear was it's over in terms of police uh, acting um, you know, without uh, care. As a result, Vancouver Police Chief Jim Chu put in motion a bridge to build communication between police and the residents of the downtown east side. He then started to want to meet with community groups, family members, and women's organizations, and we created a committee called Sister Watch, which uh, had the mandate to examine a police response to the disappearances and murders and violence against women in general in the downtown Eastside Vancouver. Sister Watch was a result of Ashley's death. It was the beginning of a new relationship with Vancouver Police Department. And with the new chief in place, he was um, more open-minded to listening to what the community had to say. We still don't know exactly what happened to Ashley Machiskinik, but Mona Woodward is convinced there are people who were there that night who saw what happened. Somebody, somebody out there knows who did it. Somebody out there knows what happened to her. Will the circumstances that led to Ashley Machiskinik's death ever be exposed? Will changes made in the Vancouver Police Department bring justice for Ashley and for Daniela Rue, another victim of the downtown east side? For more information, or if you have answers, go to our website. Danielle LaRue was 25 years old and lived on the streets in Vancouver's downtown east side. There were no reported last sightings of her or searches. But before she vanished, Danielle had a life. She was someone's child, someone's sister, someone's grandchild. Danielle was born on March 1st, 1977. She was a big sister to Kim and Norman Jr. Kim LaRue remembers Danielle's spirit and the nickname that described her perfectly. Holy smoke. <laughs> Holy smoke. And she was, she was just, she was just mad, mad for life. Like, she just, she, she was crazy and, and just so happy at being crazy. She was just a light. Danielle's grandpa Robert loved her spark and gave her the nickname that stuck. I called her Holy Smoke because she was feisty and riff. We lived at the lake and she used to pack firewood for me for the stove. Jules and Leslie, my dad's older children, are, were living with us and they decided to go ride bikes. When Danielle went around a corner, she fell and she almost cut her ear right off. And she, she came home with her head wrapped in this bandage. Her whole head was wrapped in this bandage. And she was being treated really, really well, like she was being catered to. And for some reason in my head as a child, I thought it was because she had this hat on. So I tried to tear the hat off her. Yeah, it wasn't good. But it was funny as hell. Yeah, she, she loved that story. Danielle's childhood was far from carefree. Her grandmother, Evelyn Dick, struggles to recall the good times. I think one of the happy times was their parents' wedding. Um, we were up there and, and uh, they were in their pretty little dresses and she was always so pretty, so pretty. And uh, it was, it, it, she was quite joyful. To be quite honest, I don't remember a lot of times when Danielle was really happy. Danielle was abused when she was young. And her mom um, was too young to be a good mom. And so they were put into foster care. Then they were taken out of foster care. Then they were put back in foster care. Some solace was found when the kids were in Kamloops with their grandparents who did their very best to provide a safe environment. Love and, you know, sort of, you know, tried to settle them down give them good food and clothes and 
Danielle and her siblings were often at the mercy of the child welfare system's revolving door. My mom was, uh, she was a strong woman in many ways, but she had weaknesses, um, mainly being alcohol and prescription pills. You never knew what you were gonna get from her when she was drinking. Um, there could be a lot of love or there could be a lot of anger. And she showed the most anger to Danielle. The abuse that Danielle suffered changed what should have been a happy childhood. I think that she learned so young to defend herself and that she realized it's me or nobody's going to look after me. Years of abuse and torment reached a flashpoint in Danielle's teens. My mom, as she got older, she tried to make it like that stuff didn't happen. It was just too late, and especially for Danielle. So she just ran away for good and started living on the streets of Prince George. It wasn't long before Kim followed in Danielle's footsteps. I started to run away. I'm surprised I wasn't a victim of the Highway of Tears because I hitchhiked up and down BC I don't know how many times. In Prince George, Danielle's drug addiction and sexual exploitation were consuming her. She hoped to escape and set her sights on Vancouver. And we always knew that in Prince George, we knew that when somebody went to Vancouver, they didn't come back. Whether that be they went to jail, they died, they OD'd, they were killed. They just, once you went to Vancouver, you didn't come back. Well, the, the, the driving force, I think, that brings most people down to the downtown east side is the, you know, the atmosphere down there is pretty much 24 hours. The poverty, the, the, the background, you know, you know, the sexual abuse, the mental, physical abuse, all those things combined. You know, and you get these young kids running away from different parts of, of Canada and they end up down here. After years of surviving abuse and spiraling deeper into her addiction, the connection between Danielle and her family was strained. She would call me collect from Vancouver and ask me for money or, you know, whatever. And so we were keeping contact that way, but it was years. I hadn't seen her for years when she went missing. It's not known exactly when Danielle went missing. There was no missing persons report, no newspaper or television coverage to alert family and friends. It wasn't until New Year's Eve 2002 when the Vancouver Police Department received an anonymous letter that anyone even noticed Danielle was missing. This is about Vancouver prostitute who disappeared at the end of November 2002. She is dead. Five months later, on May 12, 2003, Vancouver police released their first alert that Danielle LaRue was missing. They just said that uh, Danielle was missing and they believed that she, she had met with the worst fate possible. They did not specifically think, that, say to us, that she had been killed. They didn't even tell us there was a letter. To her family, I am more sorry for this than you can imagine. I did not intend this, but I am still responsible. Wish I could take it back, but can't. She will not be unwarned. I think somebody cared. Somehow, I don't know if it was through prostitution or just a friend or, or something. Something about that letter, you know. Somebody cared. Much of the content of the letter has not been shared by Vancouver police, which is agonizing for Danielle's sister, Kim. Like, how much time has to go by before we're allowed to know? It's, it's horrible losing somebody and not knowing what happened to them. You know, she could have gone through so much, and she, like, no matter what this man wrote in the letter, we don't know if that's true. Late November or early December of 2002, Daniel LaRue was taken. Her loss has left a void in her family and is a terrifying reminder that so many Indigenous women and girls remain at risk. If you have any information, visit our website. How is the downtown Eastside neighborhood dealing with the epidemic of violence against women? And what is being done to change these statistics for women like Ashley Machiskanik and Danielle LaRue? In September 2010, Ashley Machiskinik's body was found in an alley 
below a fourth story window of the Regent Hotel. And in late November or early December of 2002, Daniela Rue disappeared into the night, never to be found. The two had something in common, living in Vancouver's downtown east side. Historically, the downtown east side was once known as the financial hub of Vancouver in the late 1800s, and along with Gastown, was the birthplace of the city. It had a high population of men who were working in the forestry and labor industry. And during the depression in the 1930s, when the unemployment rate blew up, many people stayed in what was already considered a high risk neighborhood because of the low cost of living. So often, you know, we, we don't look to the history, think about the present moment and don't understand the behavior uh, in that context. And so uh, what happened then is that the neighborhood over time um, became a place that was considered the scourge of the city. And as the scourge of the city, it also then became a place where uh, the women that were deemed to not uh, uh, deserve the protection of police, the state, uh, or of men. Uh, and uh, it became, in some ways, a, a sacrifice zone where, uh, where women were there and where men that wanted to come and do violence uh, could do so with impunity. The downtown east side has also been referred to as a hunting ground, with theories connecting missing women to serial killer Robert Picton. The girls were out working and I would talk to them about, aren't you worried about the, you know, the danger? I mean, you know, every time you're out here and get picked up by a stranger, anything could happen. And then after a while, I realized they were coming from far worse conditions than that, you know, than anything I could throw at them. You know, didn't scare them in the least you know, because of what they'd been through already. Mona Woodward is all too familiar with these conditions. The streets of the downtown east side nearly claimed her as a victim. It came down to a really bad experience I had on the street uh, where I was taken and left for dead. Like, I was almost one of the missing and murdered women. And he choked me off till he thought I was dead and threw me in a dumpster. And I woke up naked from the waist down. I just decided I didn't want to live like that anymore. And I needed to change my life. So that's what I did. I went and got help and, you know, met uh, a street worker who helped me out and helped me to get off the street and go into recovery. Mona is now a social worker and advocate to those still on the streets. I went back to school and I got into social work, you know, and uh, I found that was where I felt that I would be more useful because, you know, I wasn't just going to be the textbook social worker. I could say, like, I know what it feels. I know what it's like to be on the street. I know what it's like to be cold and hungry and homeless. And there's a better way. So I would share parts of my story to recreate that hope. Social agencies in the neighborhood provide numerous services to downtown Eastside residents. But by Dave Dixon's account, more resources are needed. I mean, you know, and when I say resources, I mean, Bonafide treatment centers. I'm talking about a, a six month or longer program because most of my clients, especially, are coming from a just a horrific background. They're literally born into, you know, the poverty and the, and the abuse. Amid the daily struggles of surviving in the downtown east side, a strong connection among those who live and work there exists. So the neighborhood is a community, without a doubt. People know each other, they know their neighbors, uh, there's uh, relationships, there's uh, closeness and connections that we probably don't see in any other part of the city. It's the downtown east side community that the families of Ashley Machiskinik and Daniela Rue are counting on to come forward and speak up about what they know. We have accepted her as gone. We firmly believe that, one, uh, that Danielle's in a better place and she's at peace. So we have found peace with that. I believe it's harder on her siblings, in particular Kimberly, and I think that she's the one that, that needs it. It would be nice to say, that's where Danielle is, and uh, we know what's happened to her. Like to know where she is, so we can end all this, because I don't want to go through this again. Got to be closure here somewhere for all of us. because this is tough. I honestly think for me, to get closure more so would be to find her than to find who did it. I would just rather have her. I think that, uh, that we have to continue to advocate 
for injustices that happen. You know, like if we didn't uh, uncover the injustice with Ashley Machiskin, it, nothing would have happened, you know? I mean, we have to go to the extreme. Like, who does that? Who takes over the police station? You know, who marches in you know, numbers of 500 just to, you know, make a point? And it should never have to be that, you know? Our women are important and they deserve the same respect as anybody else. For more information about Ashley Machiskinik and Danielle LaRue, visit our website.